awesome. I got to be honest, some of us are a little tired. We were at that fire conference this past weekend. It was fire, but we're a little tired. So bear with us, but we're excited for what's going to happen and take place in this service this morning. Also, I didn't plan to do this, but when the Lord tells you to do something, you got to do it. So, hi, I'm reading my Bible in front of you. So, I shared this in Dream Team Central uh, this morning. Some of our people that are serving on different ministry teams, I just wanted to encourage them. But, um, so, most of this you could say would be pointed or directed towards um, if you're serving or if you're a servant. But a a huge part of being a servant is being obedient. And so I also feel like this applies to those of you who maybe didn't feel like coming this morning, but you were obedient and you came. And uh, some of us who were really tired and we were still obedient and we came. So let me encourage you real quick. I'm in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion towards him boiling hot. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. Let this hope burst forth within you, releasing a continual joy. Don't give up in a time of trouble, but commune with God at all times. Some of us might be going, yeah, thank you, Lord. Some of us might be going through a time of trouble. You feel like we're kind of stuck in a rut. Well, this said, don't give up in a time of trouble, but commune with God at all times. And we're going to commune with God this morning. We're also going to do a new song. Miss Whitney's going to lead it, and it talks a lot about joy. So we're excited. We hope that you're excited. If you guys want to stand up, we're going to hop right in.
quick before we go on to the next song, I have two really important announcements. I don't want to leave these two groups of people out. Sixth through ninth grade, you are still going to be dismissed after worship. It's down in room A101. Chris Roffel, he'll be out in the lobby if you don't know where that is. And uh, secondly, not last but least, I don't know what I was just about to say. Last but not least, super important, if you're new to Clear Mountain, if it's your first Sunday here at Clear Mountain Community Church, we are so glad that you're here and we have a gift for you, a free gift for you in the guest services kiosk. Do not forget to pick that up. You're not going to want to miss it. Head out these doors, take a right, go to that guest services kiosk, let them know that you're new or it's your first Sunday and somebody's going to give you that gift with a smiling face. So, all right. Y'all ready to keep singing? Yeah. We're singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white.
up this worship service for just a moment. We're going to baptize some people. Um, amen. We've uh, had a lot of people come to Christ in the last few weeks. And of course, we've baptized several adults, but uh, God's moving downstairs as well, down in our children's ministry. So we're going to be baptizing some children this morning. So um, first off here, we are going to actually be baptizing Emerson Smith. Amen. And uh, Casey is going to read Emerson's uh, baptism testimony. So Casey. All right. Okay, so Emerson wrote, I have gone to church my whole life and have always believed in Jesus. A few months ago, I decided I wanted to be baptized. I believe Jesus died for me and he loves me and I want to spend eternity in heaven with him and all of my family. So I want to be baptized because I have accepted Jesus into my heart. So when I go under the water, the old me is gone and the new me comes out. Amen. Amen. Now I'm a Hold on, Dave. I'm going to ask you just a couple questions, Emerson. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And do you believe that God raised him from the dead? And have you asked him into your heart to be your Lord and Savior? Okay. Go ahead, Dave. Grandpa Dave is going to baptize her. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, the next one to be baptized. We have Logan up next. Yes, come on up, Logan. All right, so Logan wrote, the reason I want to get baptized is because I want to get closer to God, and I want him to control and take the steering wheel of my life. Amen. I also want to get baptized so I can go to heaven. Amen. Logan, I'm going to ask you a couple questions here. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And do you believe that God raised him from the dead? And have you made him your Lord and Savior? Okay. Doing the things Jesus commanded us to do, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. All right. Up next, we have Lexi. All right. I'll go ahead and read this. So Lexi wrote for her baptism testimony, the reason I want to get baptized is because I want to get closer to God and Jesus. Also, so I can be forgiven for all of my sins that I have asked forgiveness for. Thank you, God. You go ahead and turn around, sit down. Okay, I ask you a couple questions. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? And do you believe God raised him from the dead? And have you made him your Lord and Savior? You asked him into your heart. Okay, amen. Go ahead and hold your nose, honey. Doing the things Jesus commanded us to do, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Keep worshiping, amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I met you. I was breathing. But not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name
sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the heaven I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call me Continue with the rest of our service this morning. Thank you. Yes, Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead, and that day, that Easter Sunday morning, that first Easter, when Mary and Mary Magdalene and Salome went to the grave expecting to anoint a dead body, they saw the angel sitting there, and they said, Where is Jesus? The angel said, he is not here, he is risen. I submit to you tonight that that's the greatest news the world has ever heard. He is not here. He has conquered the grave. He's alive. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that there's more proof that Jesus Christ rose from the dead than almost any other fact in Roman history. I don't believe there's a fact in ancient history today so well proven as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even if there was no proof, no historical proof, no scientific proof, and there is, I would still believe it because I believe this book is God's inspired word and the whole early church went up and down the country preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That was the thing that shook the Roman Empire that a man had risen from the dead, that he was alive, that death could not hold him. Christ is alive. He's a living Savior.
I don't know how good of an idea it was for me to try and preach after listening to Billy Graham. So maybe I didn't think that through real well. <laughs> try and follow up his preaching, uh, not hardly. Um, but I do want to mention something here before we get uh, into the scriptures here. Um, next week is Easter, and I am so excited about celebrating our Savior's resurrection. Amen? So a couple things are going to be a little bit different about Easter. Number one, uh, we're going to be packed out um, because you're inviting a whole lot of people to Easter. You're inviting your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, people that need Jesus. You're inviting them here to hear the gospel. Um, and then there's another thing we need you to help us with, um, our parking lot. We tried to expand our parking lot a couple different times, but it's been so wet that we haven't been able to do that just yet. So because of that, we're going to have a couple of shuttles running uh, from, from here to the high school and dropping people off back here at the church. And then after the service, we'll, we'll take you back to the high school because we're not going to have enough parking to accommodate everybody here. So those of you that are home folk here, those of you that... Now, if you brought a guest and you're, you're bringing them, we don't expect you to do that. But if you're here and you're serving on Sunday morning or uh, you're just coming by yourself, I would really encourage you to just, from 9 o'clock on, we're going to be running a continuous shuttle from the high school. And if you don't know where the high school is, if you go out our road here to the left and take another left, it's right there. I mean, their, their property borders our property on the back part of our lot. So it's not real far, but if you park at the Williamsburg High School there and let us shuttle you here. That way our guests will have room to park. So I just want to encourage you to do that. We're also throwing out a $50 gift card, so when you do ride the shuttle, you'll get a ticket, and we're going to have a drawing for a $50 Visa card so you can take your family to the lunch or something like that. So I just want to encourage you, please help us out and uh, take the shuttle. I encourage you to do that. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We worship you. We just thank you for this time in the Scriptures. Uh, what an amazing book the Bible is. It reveals truth to us. It, it tells us about you and how we can have this amazing relationship with you, how we can be forgiven of our sin, how we can make heaven our eternal home. And, and Lord, we just thank you for the word of God. And we pray as we bring out the scriptures, bring out this principle today, Lord, that you would help us, that you would give us ears to hear what you would speak and help me to declare what you have spoken. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we're actually in the third week of our series that we're calling Emotions. And if you missed any of the prior weeks in the series, you can always go to our website or our YouTube channel. You can catch up there. You can watch the sermon there. Uh, we also have free CDs available of the sermons uh, in the hallway that leads over to the next building, over to the cafe that way. Uh, and in this series, we've been looking at the Bible to see what God has to say about our emotions. When God created us, he gave us emotions. Uh, and our emotions are very powerful things. And of course, we all like to experience the positive emotions, you know, like love and joy and peace and hope. And we all like feeling good. But what about the negative emotions that come our way? What should we do when fear or anger or anxiety, bitterness or depression come our way? How should we handle these negative emotions that, that have the capacity to overwhelm us? Uh, all of us are confronted with these emotions, and all, and all these emotions are real. <clears throat> but how should we respond to these emotions when they come? Well, the Bible has some things to tell us that we can do. There are some things that we can do that will help us to deal with these negative emotions. And the Bible has answers to that. We, we know that Jesus was fully human, and he experienced a wide range of emotion. He always responded properly to his emotions, though. Jesus did experience some of these negative emotions, but he was not led by his emotions. He was led by the Word of God, and he was led by the Spirit of God. And that's how we, too, can find answers for the negative emotions that we have to deal with. Through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, we can harness our emotions and we can deal with them correctly. So last week, we talked about uh, finding relief from anxiety. And this week, we want to talk about dealing with emotions that come to you when you're mistreated or when you are wronged. We're going to talk about dealing with uh, the, the, the bitterness and the resentment that comes from offenses. Uh, and the truth is, offenses are going to come to every one of us. Uh, we're really not able to avoid them. They are inevitable. Jesus told us that they were coming. So I want to go to Luke, the 17th chapter, where Jesus explains this. Uh, verse 1, he says this, Then he said to the disciples, It's impossible that no offenses should come. It's impossible. If Jesus says it's impossible, it's impossible. Jesus said it's impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. 
And, and, and this is really what Jesus said here. Jesus is saying, offenses are impossible to avoid. By the way, this is in your bulletin notes if you want to fill in the blanks. But offenses are impossible to avoid. Jesus warned us that offenses are going to come our way. So you might as well be prepared to deal with them. You know, we're living in a fallen, broken world with, <laughs> it's full of fallen, broken people, which includes me and you. And because of that reality, offenses are going to come. There are going to be people in your life that are going to hurt you. There, there may be people that betray you. Some might take advantage of you, use you. Some will steal from you, take what belongs rightfully to you. Some will speak evil of you. They'll spread gossip about you. They will, they will try to manipulate you or deceive you in some way. So in this fallen, broken world we live in, people are going to mistreat you. They are going to hurt you. And you're going to have plenty of opportunities to be offended. Plenty of opportunities to hold grudges. And that's the natural human response when offenses come our way. But you can choose to respond to those offenses differently. You can actually choose something better. You can choose to do what Jesus taught us to do, and you can forgive those who have wronged you and stay free from the negative emotions like bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness. Or you can hold on to those, those toxic emotions, and you can hold grudges against people that have wronged you. But choosing to hang on to those offenses can be very self-destructive. Unforgiveness is a poison that destroys our lives, and it actually taints all of our relationships. It's actually Satan's tool to blind us and to keep us in bondage. Unforgiveness has wrecked countless marriages. It's destroyed many homes. Uh, it's torn families apart. It's pitted brother against sister. Uh, it's turned many uh, close friends into bitter enemies. It's destroyed churches. It's divided nations. It's caused wars. It's brought down entire empires. Unforgiveness damages people's mental and emotional health. And it's also responsible for a vast amount of sickness and disease. The, the research on this subject is extensive, and the results are, are undeniable. Bitterness and unforgiveness are very damaging to our bodies, and they're very damaging to our minds. When we hold grudges, when we refuse to forgive, it actually releases chemicals in our bodies that break down our immune system, and they cause many different sickness and diseases. Uh, unforgiveness is not healthy. And unforgiveness doesn't just damage our physical health, it actually affects our emotional health as well. You're never going to be emotionally healthy until you learn to forgive people. We need to realize, uh, this, this really is what we need to realize about the damaging effects of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Really, it, it's, it's toxic. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping that the other person dies. You may think that your resentment is affecting the person that wronged you, but you are really the one that's suffering when you refuse to give, forgive. By choosing to hang on to your bitterness, you're actually doing great harm to yourself. Unforgiveness affects you emotionally, it affects you physically, it affects you spiritually. It's a toxic poison that, that really taints your whole life. And I want to illustrate that kind of with a little object lesson here. Here we have some clear, clean water. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to contaminate the water here or taint the water a little bit. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of uh, unforgiveness here. So if we uh, choose to let unforgiveness come, it can really, just a little bit of unforgiveness can really taint our lives. It can color us uh, in so many different ways. It can affect us in so many different ways. And when, when that unforgiveness comes, it's going to affect your other relationships. It's going to affect maybe even your work habits. It's going to affect your health. This unforgiveness is going to taint a whole lot of other things. But what forgiveness does, what Jesus told us to do, if we take what he says to do, that unforgiveness will then stop all of that coloring and all that tainting of our lives, and it'll clear all that up. It'll get rid of the bitterness. It'll get rid of the resentment. It'll get rid of the anger. It'll get rid of the things that are holding us in bondage. So I want to encourage you to, to take the step and just forgive those that have wronged you. So we can see just from this illustration how just a, a few uh, drops of food coloring affected this whole container of water. And that's really an illustration of the way unforgiveness taints your whole life. It starts off small maybe, it's a small offense, but then it spreads to other things in your life. It affects your other relationships. You, you become bitter, you become cynical, and you, you become less trusting of others. Uh, you quit being real and honest with other people and you build a protective wall around your heart. 
And you don't go very deep in your relationships. And that bitterness and that resentment that you choose to hold on to actually continues to cause you pain. Even though the event may be over, you're carrying that with you and in you. By refusing to forgive, you're allowing that person that hurt you to continue hurting you, to continue causing you pain. And just as that bleach restored the water and brought it back to clarity, forgiveness will bring clarity back to your relationships. Forgiveness brings healing to your uh, heart, to your emotions, and to your relationship with God. Forgiveness penetrates uh, areas of the darkness, and, and they bring light and hope to it. Forgiveness allows emotional healing to take place, and it really just leads us into increased intimacy with God. So here's the truth about forgiveness. You benefit more from forgiveness than those you forgive. You benefit more from forgiveness than those you forgive. Forgiveness brings freedom. When you forgive, you reclaim your power to choose. It doesn't matter whether someone deserves forgiveness. You deserve to be free. That's the reality. Staying angry and bitter is just like you know, kind of banging your head against a brick wall. You're not going to hurt the bricks. You're only going to hurt yourself. So we can choose to, to do that, continue to bang our head against the wall, or we can choose to extend forgiveness to people who don't deserve it, who have not earned it, and actually might even misuse it. But we should still forgive those who have wronged us, even if they don't deserve it, because you deserve to be free. That's the reality of the situation. Jesus paid a huge price for your freedom, and unforgiveness will rob you of that freedom. And we can never forget the mercy and the grace that God demonstrated to us as sinners. When we, when we were full of sin, when we were offending God, when we were doing everything wrong, God forgave us. And in light of that, we should be offering forgiveness to other people. And that's really the point that Jesus brought out in this parable that he told in the 18th chapter of Matthew. And I want to look at that parable. This is from Matthew, the 18th chapter, starting with verse 21. Uh, and it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And actually in one, uh, another version of this story, um, it actually, I think it's Luke's gospel, it talks about up to seven times in the same day. And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Or actually, one, it's kind of a, a little fuzzy in the Greek, whether it's 77 or 70 times seven. So if it's actually 70 times seven, it's 490 times. In a day, you're called to forgive. The, the point is, it's limitless forgiveness. You have to offer that forgiveness unlimited. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Now, this is huge. In our day, it's millions of dollars. 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him, this man that owed that much. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him. This is a picture of the father. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which is a, a much smaller, obviously, amount of, of debt that was incurred. He grabbed him and began to choke him. That's sometimes the violent response of offenses. <laughs> we want to grab them by the neck and choke them. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured and he should, until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Very uh, telling words, very important words from Jesus. Jesus here shows us just how serious this sin of unforgiveness is. It, it cuts us off from God. It hinders our relationship with God. It cuts us off from the forgiveness that we need from God, which is really far worse than what it does to our bodies and minds. 
So unforgiveness is bad for our health and for our mental and emotional health and our bodies, but it's far worse from a spiritual standpoint. That's far worse than what it does to our bodies and minds. God has forgiven us of a massive debt. We've been shown so much kindness, so much mercy by our Heavenly Father that we have no right to withhold our forgiveness to anyone. His abundant mercy to us is really obligates us to forgive those who have wronged us. And, and really, here's the truth about forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the best things you can do for yourself. Forgiveness is one of the best things you can do for yourself. You know, we, we think that it's going to benefit the person we're forgiven the most. The truth is, we actually benefit more from forgiveness than those we forgive. Forgiveness brings freedom from the bondage that comes from resentment, that comes from bitterness. And sometimes the reason we don't forgive those who have wronged us is because lots of times we just don't really even understand what forgiveness is. So I want to take just a few minutes here to help you understand what true biblical forgiveness looks like. So I, and I'll start by telling you what forgiveness is not. So number one, forgiveness is not based on feelings. Forgiveness is not based on feelings. Forgiveness is a choice that we make despite what our feelings may be telling us. Forgiveness is a function of the will. It can happen even when our emotions are leading us in a different direction, when they're dictating something else. So, so let me give you a truth that will help you when your feelings tell you not to forgive. Remember this, choices lead and feelings follow. Choices lead and feelings follow. I like to think of the, the, the choices as the front of the train and the feelings are the caboose. They're at the back of the train. You make the right choice and then the feelings will eventually follow. They'll eventually come in line behind you. So if you'll make the choice to forgive first, then your feelings eventually will fall in line. But, not letting, uh, but letting your feelings rather lead you is a very dangerous proposition. You cannot afford to do that because your feelings are not going to lead you to forgive. Your feelings are going to lead you to take revenge. But if you'll make the decision to obey God and choose to forgive, your feelings will eventually follow your choice. When we choose to do the right things, the feelings do eventually come. So remember, choices lead and feelings follow. All right, we're going to move on to the next thing that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not refusing to take the wrong seriously. Forgiveness is not refusing to take the wrong seriously. You know, we, we can't truly forgive until we clearly see the offense that we're forgiven. You know, some people think in order to forgive someone, they have to dismiss the wrong, kind of pass it off as insignificant. You know, they think if, by reducing the offense that it'll be easier to forgive. But to really be free from, from the offense, we need to see it as it truly is, um, because that's what God does. That, that's the way God treats us. He sees sin for the offense that it really is. God doesn't say, well... You know, I don't think your sin is all that bad. I know you couldn't help yourself, and it's okay. Go ahead and sin. No, he tells us that sin is wrong, that sin has consequences. And actually, the crucifixion of Jesus just shows us how serious the sin issue is. The cost for our sin was very great. God doesn't pass off our sin as insignificant. Yet, he still offers us complete forgiveness. So forgiveness is not making excuses for the wrong behavior and attempt to maybe try and lessen the offense. Forgiveness is not saying what happened was okay. Forgiveness means we face up to the reality of the offense and we still choose to forgive. It's actually a demonstration of greater grace when we fully acknowledge the depth of the offense and then we still choose to completely forgive. All right, let's move on to the next thing that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not denying the hurt. Forgiveness is not denying the hurt. So it's not wrong to acknowledge that we're hurting. You know, gossip and lies will wound you. Infidelity hurts deeply. Betrayal cuts you to the core. You know, when Jesus was betrayed, he acknowledged the pain that he felt. He said, Judas, do you have to betray me with a kiss? Why do you betray me in that manner? That betrayal hurt Jesus very deeply, but it didn't stop him from forgiving. Right in the midst of his torment on the cross, Jesus prayed for all that were responsible for his crucifixion, including Judas. He prayed for all of them, and he completely forgave them. So we too can be honest, and we can acknowledge our pain. It's okay to admit that offenses hurt. God wants us to tell him how we feel. He tells us to take our pain to him, to give him our hurt, to, to let it go and give it to him. He knows what to do with it. He created our hearts, and he knows how to heal broken hearts. 
So it's okay to acknowledge the pain when we're, when we're suffering and when we're experiencing a, a hurt or an offense. It's okay to take that to God and say what it is. All right, the next thing that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. So forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. You know, forgiveness only requires one party. It only requires one person. But reconcilia reconciliation requires both parties coming to an agreement. And that's something that we can't always control. Here's what we're told in the book of Romans. This is Romans, the 12th chapter, starting with verse 17, says this. Paul is speaking, this is Paul speaking to believers at Rome, and he says, but do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. This is the verse that really, I, this is the part I wanted to get to. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes that's all you can do is what depends upon you. You can't, you can't control the other person. But as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. God's the one in the revenge business. For it's written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We don't return evil for evil. We, we overcome evil with good. And verse 18 says, if it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with everyone. And this verse also, there's a flip side to that verse. This verse helps us to realize that we should do our part to, to reconcile and be at peace. But this verse also tells us that there will be times when reconciliation is just not a, a, a situation. It's not possible. The person you forgive may not want to be reconciled to you. They may not want to see you. They may not want to talk to you. You know, sometimes it may not be wise even to have a close relationship with the person that you forgave. You may not want to be in a position where they can continue to wound you or continue to abuse you. They can continue to cause you more pain. You know, if your best friend had an affair with your spouse, your friendship is probably not going to be restored. There's probably not going to be reconciliation there. But that does not mean you can't grant them total forgiveness. The, the person who's been wrong can still forgive their offender even when there is no reconciliation that occurs. Now, of course, we know that if reconciliation occurs, that's a good thing. If relationships can be restored, that is a good thing. But in many cases, that's just not possible. That won't happen. <coughs> but total forgiveness of that person, that can still happen. That can always happen on your part. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, we've covered four things that forgiveness is not. Now, let me give you six things that forgiveness is. <coughs> forgiveness is being completely aware of the offense, but still choosing forgiveness. Forgiveness is being completely aware of the offense, but still choosing forgiveness. You know, there is no spiritual victory if we think we're, we're forgiving people when we're just refusing to acknowledge the offense. You know, acting like it really, nah, not that big deal, didn't really happen. You know, sometimes we think, I want to forgive them, but I'm not sure I can do that if I really fully understand what happened. We don't want to acknowledge the truth about the offense because we want to maybe deflect the pain of the offense. But complete forgiveness acknowledges what was done without denial and still releases the offender for their wrong. So in the beginning, total forgiveness is painful. It hurts when we kiss revenge goodbye. It hurts when we think the, the person that wounded us may be getting off scot-free. But when we fully acknowledge what was done and we release our offender for their wrong, we actually cross over into a supernatural realm. We draw on a power that's greater than our own, and we begin to be more like Jesus. We experience God's hand shaping us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ, and we are better off for it in the end. All right, the, the, the next thing forgiveness is. <clears throat> forgiveness is choosing to keep no record of the wrongs. Forgiveness is choosing to keep no record of the wrongs. I want you to think about this. Why do we want to keep track of the, of the times that we were wronged? What's the purpose of that? To prove what happened? To maybe waive our offenses before someone who doubts that they happened? To maybe use it for our benefit later on? Or maybe to, to point the finger of blame at the perpetrator? And to excuse maybe our behavior that's not Christ-like? Well, you know, they did this to me, so they deserve this treatment. 
So we justify our own sin. So we have to choose a different course of action. We have to choose to tear up those record of wrongs that we've been keeping. We, we clearly see the wrong that was done, but we destroy the record of it before it gets a, a chance to be lodged into our hearts. Then resentment doesn't have a chance to grow. When we develop a lifestyle of forgiveness, we learn to erase the wrong instead of you know, filing it away in our mental computer. It's very similar to what happens when we log off of our computers. And the computer asks us, do you want to save this document? That's when we choose the delete option. And we choose, no, I don't want to save the record of this wrong. And when we continually do this, we avoid bitterness. And we experience, really, the blessing of complete forgiveness. And it really is an amazing blessing. All right, the next thing that forgiveness is. Forgiveness is refusing to punish. Forgiveness is refusing to punish. Refusing to punish those who deserve it is really the essence of true forgiveness. It's, it's giving over our natural desire to see people get, get what's coming to them. You know, because our human nature craves justice. We do. Our human nature craves ju justice. And we struggle with the idea of someone who deeply hurt us just getting away with that. It's just not fair. We want revenge. We want to see them punished. But the fear of them not being punished is the opposite, the Bible says, of perfect love. Look what it says in 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 18. John wrote this to the church, uh, the Apostle John. He said, there is no fear in love, but perfect, perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So real love and forgiveness is refusing to punish. It's refusing to give in to the fear that if I forgive, then this person, <laughs> they'll be off the hook. They'll be off the hook. They'll be unpunished. Sometimes we fear that God won't step in. He won't give our enemies what they deserve. But when you give in to this fear, you're trespassing on God's territory. And he doesn't like that. Vindication is God's prerogative. Vengeance belongs to God. We read that. Actually, I want to go back to those verses in Romans, the 12th chapter. This is verse 17. It says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. For it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Don't take revenge. Don't issue the punishment that you want to give that other person. My dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. That's his job. For it's written, it's mine, God says, to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So in one way, revenge is kind of like God's glory because he's only pleased when he gets it. <laughs> Vindication is what God does. God doesn't want our help with this. So when we refuse to be instruments of punishment, God likes that. God's then free to do what should be done. But if we maneuver our way into this process, and we, we may hinder God's true justice from being carried out. So we need to examine ourselves in this area. We need to ask ourselves, how much of what I'm about to say or what I'm about to do is an attempt to punish? And if punishment is our motive, then we're about to grieve the Holy Spirit. So in our forgiveness, we have to refuse to punish. Okay, the next thing that forgiveness is, number four. Forgiveness is the absence of bitterness. Forgiveness is the absence of bitterness. Bitterness is, is the strong desire for revenge that comes from deep resentment. It's at the very top of the list for the things that, that the Bible says that grieves God, that grieves the Spirit of God. Here's what it says in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Starting with verse 30, says this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So he starts off this truth here by saying, don't do this, don't grieve the Spirit of God. Here's how you grieve him. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. So the first thing that's at the top of the list is bitterness that grieves the Spirit of God. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Once again, linking it to the great forgiveness that we've received from God. Be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted, forgiving one another. This is what brings the Holy Spirit to bear in our situation. The other, the bitterness, the wrath, the clamor, that brings, that grieves the Holy Spirit of God. This brings the Holy Spirit on our scene when we do what it says there in verse 32. So uh, bitterness was the very first thing that Paul mentions when he talks about grieving the Holy Spirit. In the book of Hebrews, actually, uh, the Apostle Paul calls bitterness a root. 
bitterness is the root cause of many other problems. It's kind of what I tried to illustrate there with the, the water. Bitterness, um, it will manifest itself in many different ways. You know, sometimes it can cause depression in people. Sometimes it can lead to uh, an obsession with getting even. Sometimes it can cause a negative uh, attitude about life to surface in you. It can cause you to be quick-tempered maybe and lash out at others very quickly. It can certainly lead to health problems like high blood pressure, like ulcers. But the very worst thing that happens with bitterness is what Paul says in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. He says this. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many becoming defiled. So he's saying, be careful that you don't fall short of the grace of God through this root of bitterness. This bitterness is going to cause you to miss the grace of God. Or this says here, fall short of the grace of God. It's going to cause that grace not to flow into your life that you need. We all need the grace of God working in our lives, and that will hinder the grace of God from flowing into our lives. Bitterness will cause you to miss out on the grace of God. And, and you, you can't really experience God's grace when you're bitter. It's just a very bad place to be. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, you miss out on the grace that you need to overcome. You miss out on what you need for every other part of life. When the Holy Spirit is grieved, His power in us is diminished. Now, He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. So I'm not saying the Holy Spirit leaves us. Just the grace and the power of the Holy Spirit that we need is, is not there when we need it. He's hindered in what He's able to do in us. And you're going to struggle more and more in your emotions because bitterness is a root emotion. Other negative emotions like fear and anger and anxiety will gain a foothold in you because of the root of bitterness. And the power of, of, of grace and the power of the Holy Spirit is not available to help you get free. But when we let go of bitterness, it's an open invitation for, to manifest the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. His love, His joy, His peace are able to be manifested in us to help us overcome the negative emotions and free us from our bitterness. The Holy Spirit is able to do His work in us, making us more like Christ. Living in the grace of God is one of the incredible benefits of forgiveness. But to truly forgive, we have to let go of bitterness. You can't have both. All right, the next thing that forgiveness is, number five, forgiveness is forgiving God. Forgiveness is forgiving God. Even though we don't always see it, sometimes our bitterness is directed at God. And many times it's an unconscious anger. And we suppress it because it's really too painful to think about. It's too painful to admit. But deep down in our hearts, we believe that God is the one who has allowed these bad things to happen to us. You know, after all, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing. Couldn't he have prevented these tragedies and these offenses from coming? Why has God allowed us to suffer when we didn't do anything to warrant this, this bad treatment? And we wrongly believe that God is the one to blame for our pain and our suffering. The reality is we were born into a world that's far different than God's original plan. We need to understand that because of man's wrong choices, we have been born into a spiritual war zone, and we have an enemy that's on the loose, and his agenda is to steal, kill, and destroy. God's a good God. He is not the one to blame for our suffering. Man handed the authority that God gave him over to Satan, and Satan is the one behind all the suffering and all the evil that's present in our world. So if we're struggling with the thought of God allowing evil to exist in this world, then we need to extend genuine forgiveness towards God. Because any bitterness towards God grieves the Holy Spirit. So we, we must release any bitterness towards God for any evil that's touched our lives. Because God's not guilty. God is not guilty. All right, the last thing I want to mention about forgiveness is this. Number six. Forgiveness is forgiving ourselves. Forgiveness is forgiving ourselves. We know that forgiveness means forgiving people. We know that it means forgiving God. But complete forgiveness must also include forgiving ourselves. And sometimes this can be the hardest kind of forgiveness you do. Because there's no lasting joy in forgiveness if we don't forgive ourselves. Complete forgiveness includes forgiving ourselves for our failures and for our sins. Not forgiving ourselves is just as wrong as not forgiving others. We've got to see that. I'm going to repeat that. Not forgiving ourselves is just as wrong as not forgiving others. God loves us just as much as he loves others. And in the very same way he wants to forgive others, he wants us to forgive ourselves. You know, it's not really humble to beat yourself up and withhold the forgiveness that God wants you to experience. And I know we don't always feel worthy of that forgiveness. 
we found out earlier, forgiveness is not based on feelings. It's not based on feelings. It's based on the faithfulness of God. And it's freely given. It is freely given to everyone who's willing to receive it. So we matter to God, and he wants us to accept the forgiveness that he offers. And to be emotionally healthy, we need to forgive ourselves. God's already forgiven us. We just need to receive that forgiveness. We just need to let go of the self-condemnation. And I pray that this teaching today has given you a better understanding of what genuine forgiveness is all about. Because every follower of Jesus needs to experience the benefits of living a lifestyle of forgiveness. You know, when you truly forgive, it's like the Lord kind of reaches into your heart and he just rips out all the bitterness, all the anger, all the resentment. He just throws it away. You know, the pain that once controlled you, it disappears and you experience freedom. That's the power of forgiveness. Complete forgiveness brings so much freedom, so much joy. I'm tempted to call it selfish because we are the ones that benefit the most when we forgive. And what I'd like to do here in just a moment, I want to give everyone an opportunity to pray. I want to give everyone an opportunity to forgive anybody, anybody who might have hurt you. I want to encourage you to let go of any grudges toward anyone that's wronged you. And I would recommend maybe even just uh, quietly calling out their name to God and declaring that they're forgiven. Let go of any ill will towards anyone, towards any of our offenders. Just release them to God. And by forgiving them, you're not denying that what they did was okay. You're not saying, oh, it's all right, it's okay. But you are choosing to forgive them. And you're, you're refusing to punish them for what, they're, uh, what they've done, for what their offense is. You're refusing to return evil for evil. And you're giving all judgment over to God, who judges righteously. And please remember, forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an act of your will. So as you obey God in forgiveness, your emotions might not immediately change. I, they, they probably won't. But as you continue with an attitude of forgiveness, your feelings will eventually come around. They will eventually respond. And you will get free from those feelings of bitterness and resentment. And what I'd like this, us to, to go ahead and do now is let's just bow our heads. Let's just go to God in prayer. I, I, I believe God's dealing with some of you right now about forgiving someone who's wronged you. And for some, it may be a parent that mistreated you or a parent that abandoned you. They made your life miserable. For some, it might be a, a relative, a brother or sister that's wronged you in some way. Um, for some of you, it may be an ex that did you wrong and made your life a living hell. Some of you need to forgive a person that's been lying about you or spreading gossip about you. Some of you need to forgive your boss or maybe a co-worker that's wronged you. Some of you... <laughs> need to forgive the politicians that are running our country, that are making horrible choices, that are robbing us of our freedom, that are destroying our nation. And you need to let go of any bitterness towards them and release them to God. God's the one that will bring justice. So whoever you need to forgive, now is the time to do it. Our helper, the Holy Spirit, is here to lead us into the freedom that comes from forgiveness. So as Austin plays, I want to encourage you to take this time to pray, forgive anyone, anybody that's wronged you, and if you can pray right there in the pew, or we're going to open it up here. If you want to pray up front, you can certainly do that. You can pray up front, but the, the main thing is just release this thing to God. Let God know that you're giving it over to him.